Oh, take this off, right? <laughs> good morning. It is good to see you all here on this foggy, dreary day, but it's good to be in the Lord's house. And for those of you that are joining us online, thank you for being here with us, and I uh, hope that you can praise even though that you're not able to be here in person. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing Shout to the North. Father God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that while things around us seem hectic and crazy, that your peace can be with us. Lord, help us to remember that. Help us to know that you are sovereign, you are in control. Lord, help us to rely on you. Uh, we pray for our country, we pray for our leaders. Uh, as we do this change, we pray for uh, wisdom and and hard work to make a difference. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing Shout to the North. Men of faith rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You are strong when you feel weak, in your brokenness complete. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up, women of the truth, stand and sing to broken hearts, who can the healing power of our awesome King of love. Shout it out. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Savior to all. Lord of heaven and earth. We've been through fire, we've been through rain, we've been refined by the power of his name. We've fallen deeper in love with you, you burn the truth on our lips. Shout to the north and the south, sing to East and the West, Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and south sing to the east and the west jesus is savior to all lord of heaven and earth you are lord of heaven and earth you are lord of heaven and earth, lord of heaven and earth. encamped along hills of light ye christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in bells below let all our strength be hurled faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world faith is the victory faith is a victory oh glorious victory that overcomes the world his banner over us is love our sword the word of god 
we trust the saints above with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, right raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus conquering name. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Everybody falls sometimes Gotta find the strength to rise From the ashes And make a new beginning Anyone can feel the ache You think it's more than you can take But you're stronger Stronger than you know don't you give up now the sun will soon be shining you gotta face the clouds to find the silver lining i've seen dreams that move the mountains hope that doesn't ever end even when the sky is Falling, I've seen miracles just happen. Silent prayers get answered, broken hearts become brand new. That's what faith can do. It doesn't matter what you've heard. Impossible is not a word, it's just a reason for someone not to try. Everybody's scared to death when they decide to take that step out on the water, but it'll be all right. Life is so much more than what your eyes are seeing you will find your way if you keep believing i've seen dreams that move the mountains hope that doesn't ever end even when the sky is falling i've seen Miracles just happen Silent prayers get answered Broken hearts become brand new That's what faith can do Overcome the odds When you don't have a chance That's what faith can do When the world says you can I'll tell you that you can I've seen dreams that move the mountain Hope that doesn't ever end Even when the sky is falling I've seen miracles just happen Silent prayers get answered Broken hearts become brand new that's what faith can do. That's what faith can do.
That's what faith can do. Even if you fall sometimes, you will find the strength to rise. Thank you, praise team. You always do a wonderful job. And uh, thank you, Mitch Richardson, for making that cameo appearance uh, just a moment ago. Okay. All right. One thing you have to understand when you're dealing with uh, technology is something will always go wrong. Always goes wrong. Life is full of tests. We talked about that last week. Full of tests. Medical tests. MRIs, CTs, lab tests, and that dreaded colonoscopy test. God also tests us, doesn't he? We looked at that last week. Uh, King David tells us in Psalms that God tests the righteous. By righteous, he simply means believers. God tests believers. Last week from the first chapter of 1 Peter, we learned four things about tests. God tests, they're temporary. Thank the Lord that they are. They don't last forever. They're necessary, however. He does it for a reason. And they are uh, purifying because they have a way of um, burning away anything that is not faith. And then they are also beneficial. They have a purpose. They have a reason. Today we're going to continue to look at tests, but try to answer this question. Not uh, the fact that God tests, but how does he test us? How does he test us? In Luke chapter 17, verse 2, Jesus' disciples, his apostles, came to him and asked him a question. And here was the question. Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. I'm sure they didn't really understand what they were asking for. And they didn't know how God was going to answer that prayer. And uh, it's perhaps something that we don't enjoy either. Because the way God increased their faith was by testing that faith. Testing that faith. See, faith is a little like a muscle. It has to be exercised. It has to be stretched. It has to be strained. And that's the purpose of a test, to stretch our faith and help us to grow thereby. But I hope you understand that uh, even though we're being tested today in various ways, uh, COVID-19, obviously, uh, by the way, Gay and I were able to get our first injection uh, last Monday, kind of a surprise, but uh, we were able to get that done. Uh, but uh, I know many are, are waiting for uh, their first vaccination, and we hope that it comes very, very soon with either uh, more vaccine becoming available or more sites being opened up or both. But we're definitely being taxed, uh, or rather tested, I should say, by um, the uh, fact that COVID-19 has been with us, gosh, for how long now? <laughs> it seems such a long time. Do you remember before COVID-19? Do you remember what it was like? seems like so long ago. Likewise, we're being tested by the aftermath of it. Sometimes uh, the financial stress, some dire financial stress and the loss of jobs or maybe in the loss of hours or uh, maybe their uh, salaries being uh, cut one way or another. Uh, but uh, definitely uh, there are the uh, consequences of COVID and the things that follow that. And then add to that our national division. And uh, just because the election is over, uh, it's becoming apparent to me, I don't know if it's becoming apparent to you, that the uh, divide is not over. The divide is not over. Just a call for unity, unfortunately, is not going to be enough to produce unity. We're being tested in so many different ways. I mentioned that our churches are being tested. Uh, tested by attendance, for one thing. Uh, some are not afraid to come. Others are uh, being tested by our finances. I mentioned to you that uh, last year uh, our giving was 16% below what the budget was. And I'm sure that our church uh, is probably not too much different uh, than uh, many other churches uh, regarding uh, their finances. 
I began to think, uh, what's church going to look like once um, uh, COVID-19 gets underhand? At least I hope we get it underhand. What's church going to look like? I heard uh, someone talking about uh, the plight of restaurants in America that I thought I could see a parallel with. Uh, many, unfortunately, restaurants have uh, gone under and probably will never come back again. But others have uh, hurt significantly, but they hope to eventually reopen. And someone said, well, what do you think that reopen is going to look like once that it's okay to uh, go to uh, restaurants? You know, that herd mentality has taken place and all that stuff. And the guy, I guess, was sort of a, an expert on uh, business, said, well, you know, one third of people are already going to restaurants. You know, it's not going to be anything new to them. They're already going, you know, they'll just go uh, as they always had. Another third will slowly come back. Now, they'll test the waters a little bit, you know, they'll be a little cautious. Uh, they'll wonder uh, uh, how much jeopardy they're putting uh, themselves in, and, uh, but they'll slowly trickle back, but it will take a while. But then the startling thing, he said, is one third will never come back. One third will never come back. Their habits have changed. Their practices have changed. They're not accustomed to going to restaurants anymore. One third will never come back. I wonder if that's what's going to happen to our churches. I wonder if that's what's going to happen to our churches. One third of you, you're here. You're already coming, all right? Uh, a second third, hopefully, hopefully we'll see them begin to trickle back once they feel comfortable. But what about that last third? third. Do you suppose people are so set on watching online, and I tell people I'm preaching a lot more to people online than I've ever preached to in person before, and that's just true, uh, people watching on Facebook and YouTube, and we're grateful for that, but is it creating a new habit? Is it creating a new normal? Will that last third fail to come back? We're being tested. There's no doubt about that. Do you know what Job says about tests? Something a little scary and something I don't like. In Job chapter 7, verse 17 and 18, listen to what he says. What is mankind that you, meaning God, what is mankind that you make so much of them, that you give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them every moment? Wow. You know, I mentioned two or three tests, but if you saw them, think about it. Life is a test. It is a test. And I mentioned this last week. You know, we're going we're to get out of this COVID-19. That test will be over at some point. But guess what? There'll be another test down the road. There will be another test down the road. Maybe different. May not be a health test. May be totally opposite. But there will be another test down the road. Life is a series of tests whether we recognize that or not. Today I'd like to talk about how God tests us. Many different ways. This could be a never-ending sermon series. It's not going to be. I'm going to mention two ways God tests us today and then next Sunday, two more ways that God tests us. But just keep in mind, there are many, many different ways that God tests us. How does God test us? One of the ways is through difficulties. Difficulties. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. I've tested you in the furnace of affliction. You ever been in God's furnace of affliction? Well, we may be in one right now, but there is this reality according to the prophet Isaiah that that is one of the things that God does. We'll talk about why in just a moment. That is one of the things that God does. He tests us in the furnace of affliction, in difficulties, in difficulties. Sometimes God does that perhaps to get our attention. Maybe you can't get our attention in any other way. And maybe that's one of the ways for him to stop us in our tracks and show us who's really in control through difficulties. Now, we know that James chapter 1 tells us that these difficulties come in all sizes, shapes, and colors. 
He says, trials of many kinds in James 1, 2. Trials of many kinds. And so keep that in mind. Uh, many trials, many different kinds. Sometimes they are directed toward us personally, and that hurts. But sometimes they're directed toward someone that we love, and that equally hurts. Uh, if you've lost someone to COVID-19, you know how much that can hurt. And so it's a very real reality that God tests us in many different ways. I want you to know this, though. He doesn't cause these difficulties. He's not the author of these difficulties. In fact, Referring to James again, James chapter 1, verse 13, and let me precede this by reminding us that the Greek word in the New Testament for test can mean three different things, test, trial, or temptation, all right? Now, James 1, 13 is going to use it as temptation, but just translate it in your mind as test and trial, because I think that it's talking about an interchangeable uh, fact. Uh, James 1, 13, when tempted or tested, no one should say, God is tempting me or God is testing me. For God cannot be tempted by evil. God does not test someone with evil. Nor does he tempt or test anyone. Do you know why God is not the author of the difficulties that test us in life? Do you know why he's not? He didn't have to be. Because life provides its own set of tests. He doesn't have to manufacture these tests. Life itself manufacture these tests. I heard someone the other day who has a loved one in the hospital on a ventilator. Been there for a couple of weeks now. Young man, by the way. On the ventilator. Make this statement. I fully understand it. And I probably have made similar statements. But this was a statement. If God doesn't get him through this thing, I'm going to be mad at God. I'm going to be mad at God. Because I prayed that God would heal him and get him off this ventilator. I'm going to be mad at God. I've heard people say that. I probably have even said that. I've acted that way if I haven't said it. But here's something that I heard that I think is helpful to keep things in perspective. Don't confuse God with life. Don't confuse God with life. God didn't cause COVID-19. You know, whether it developed in China or Lord knows where, he didn't create COVID-19. So if you've lost a loved one to COVID-19 or you've been impaired or you've been uh, uh, stricken with it, don't confuse God with life because God is not the author of these things. Now, he uses them. He uses them to test us, but he is not the author of these things. How do we respond? How do we respond? Well, let me read you a real challenge in the way God says we should respond. And then let's see if it makes sense to us. In James chapter 1, verse 2, James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials. What? Consider it pure joy? Doesn't that sound a little idiotic? If you get COVID, consider it joy. If you lose your job, consider it joy. What in the world is he saying? Well, let me first of all mention what I don't think he's saying. I don't think he's saying be glad about it. I don't think he's saying be thankful for it. That just would not be human nature. To thank God that disaster or tragedy has struck us or someone that we love. That just doesn't make sense. And that's not what he's saying. He's not saying be glad about it, be thankful about it. I think what he is saying is this. Even in the midst 
of your circumstance, you can find reason to experience the joy of the Lord. I said this Wednesday night, I'll say it again. If your circumstances being perfect are the only way that you can be happy, you're not going to be happy very often. You're not going to be happy very often because our circumstances are not always or often perfect. And I think this is what James is trying to say. I think he's trying to say that regardless of what your circumstances are, if they're bad, you can still, by your attitude and the way you respond to it, not be glad about it, not rejoice over it, but find something for which to experience the joy of the Lord. What? What? What could it be? How about the fact you're not alone? How about as a child of God, the fact you're not alone? God said, I'm with you always. He said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. And how about this? As a Christian, you're never alone. You're never alone. I keep track of the number of funerals that I do. I don't know why, I just always have. I've done over 300 funerals in my career. Many of them for people who have no faith. No faith. Now, I don't turn them down, you know, because they're not on church membership roll somewhere. I don't turn them down. I, I want to be of service, be available to them, hopefully plant a seed of the gospel somewhere here or there. But I don't turn them down, but I do pity them. I pity them because I think to myself, how horrible it is to go through the experience of losing a loved one and never know the Lord. Never know the Lord. That the Lord is not there. And that you don't have a Christian brother or sister come alongside of you and offer you their strength and comfort. If you can't find joy in anything else, find it in the fact that as a child of God, you're not alone because God is with you. And if you're a part of a church fellowship, you have brothers and sisters in Christ who likewise are with you. You're not alone. You're not alone. I think another way, reason that we can express or experience joy is the understanding that God has a reason. God has a purpose. Now, I'm not going to tell you you're going to always understand what that reason or purpose is, and maybe in this life you and I will never understand the purpose. And I'm not so sure that... You know, there are people who, when tragedy strikes, they just first question they ask is, why? Why, God, does this happen? Why? Now, I don't wish to be ugly, but I, I want to face reality. I don't think understanding why would help one bit. I don't think it would help one bit. But God has a reason and a purpose for COVID-19. He's got a reason and a purpose for a national division. He's got a reason and a purpose for everything that you and I go through and experience. That can help us experience the joy of the Lord, knowing that we're not suffering for nothing. And then also the understanding that not only is God with us, and not only that uh, He has a reason and a purpose, but He's still in control. Oh, I know sometimes life seems out of control, and you're not necessarily able to see the hand of God, but that's okay. He's still there. Why? Because He's everywhere. He's still there. How shall we respond when God tests us with difficulty? By experiencing, in spite of our circumstances, the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. God not only tests us with difficulties, He tests us with demands. Demands. By demands, I mean His commands. His commands. Uh, the Scriptures tell us that uh, in the New Testament... There are 1,050 commands. Now, I, I didn't count those. Somebody who's got way too much time on their hands counted that. But that's in the New Testament alone. 1,050 commands. How in the world are we expected to keep all of those? And some of them seem beyond anybody's ability to do so. 
These commands can seem daunting. They can seem difficult. They can seem impossible. Let me share with you one reason why I think God's commands are so hard. Please understand this is just me. It's just me. The one reason I think that they're so hard is because most of us, if not all of us, are born with a spirit of rebellion. A spirit of rebellion. What do I mean? When we're children, we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. We don't want our parents to tell us what to do. When to get up, when to go to bed, what to wear, what to eat, whether we want to go to school or not, we don't like that. And when we get older, guess what? We take that spirit of rebellion with us. We don't like our spouse to tell us what to do. We don't like the boss to tell us what to do. We don't like the government to tell us what to do either. Case in point, I think that's one of the main reasons many people are refusing to wear masks today. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And they wrap themselves, they cloak themselves in the First Amendment. I think it has nothing to do with the First Amendment. You know where I think it comes from? Pride. Pride. I know what's best. I know what I should do and shouldn't do. I don't care what the scientists say. I don't care what the proven technique uh, that is suggested says. I, I, I. I truly believe that many people push against these mask wearing and social distancing and quarantining and so forth simply because of pride. I think this same spirit of rebellion carries over into our Christian life. When it comes to obeying God, when it comes to obeying God, we may not say it out loud, but remember, we've got, we've got this tendency. We, we, we've got this desire to be in control. We've got this, uh, we've got this need to be our own uh, source of authority that keeps us from obeying what God wants us to obey. And either we say no, or we take a cafeteria approach. You know what that is? You know what that is? Oh, I like this rule over here. Yeah, I think I can keep that one. That's not too bad. Oh, no, 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 no. No, not that one. Gosh, who in the world would want to do that? I'm not going to do that. And this is the way many people, many Christians, decide how they're going to live the Christian life. It's pick and choose. It's pick and choose. What we like, what we don't like, what may be easier than something else that is harder but there we go again, this spirit of rebellion. Nobody, not even God, is going to tell me what to do. You know what this is, in essence? Setting yourself up as your own higher power. Setting yourself up as your own higher power. Oh, no, 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 I would never do that. Yes. Well, how's your obedience level? How's your obedience level? Pick and choose cafeteria approach. I've said this before. Every preacher has said this. I'll say it again. If Jesus is not the Lord of all in your life, then he's not the Lord at all in your life. That's scary, isn't it? That's scary. That's scary. Well, there are those in the scriptures who did obey, even though it was difficult. Abraham is a prime example. When God instructed Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, uh, guess what? Uh, he responded in faith. Genesis 22, 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. <laughs> there it is. And in Genesis 22, that test was a supreme test. You've got to offer your son Isaac. Now, we all know the end of the story. He didn't have to. He didn't have to follow through, but he was apparently willing. He was apparently willing 
to obey. Do you think he understood why? You remember earlier, God said you're going to be, uh, you know, the the father of a great nation, and, and he was personally childless. He and Sarah, at least, were personally childless. Then Isaac came along, this miracle baby. Some of you have had miracle babies. Uh, Miracle baby came along. And now God said, I want you to kill him. I want you to kill him. He didn't understand. He did not, do you think he wanted to do that? He did not want to do that. Why did he do it? God said to him. God said to him. D.L. Moody passed away in 1899. He was an American evangelist. He founded the Moody Church in Chicago, still alive and well in Chicago, I'm told. He once made this statement. The world has yet to see what God will do with one man fully consecrated to him. One man totally sold out. One man who obeys regardless of whether he understands it or not. Now, D.L. Moody set out to be that man. I don't know how close he came to it. But I don't know very many people, including myself, who have ever come anywhere near uh, totally selling out for God. You know, we'll do some things. We'll do a few things. Just don't mess with my lifestyle. You know, I got things pretty well worked out. I'm comfortable. Don't ask me to do something I don't want to do. God may still be waiting for that one man, that one woman, to see what he could do through. Well, Abraham wasn't the only one. Job was another one. Job 23.10. We all know the story of Job. He lost uh, all of his wealth, and apparently he was a fabulously wealthy person uh, in uh, the pre-patriarch days. And uh, worse than that, he lost all of his children. I think there were 10. They were all killed in a, uh, either a hurricane or, or tornado. He lost the respect of his wife. Uh, and yet, here's what he said in uh, Job 23, 10. But he, meaning God, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, and he definitely was tested. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Job was saying, I don't care what I go through. What happens to me? I'm not going to quit. You know, sometimes people have a life verse. For many, 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 many years, I felt guilty about that because I, you know, I really didn't have a life verse. You know, some of them would have some real neat ones, you know, like John three sixteen or, you know, whatever. Never had a life verse. About five years ago, I came across a verse that has become my life verse. Job thirteen fifteen. Job thirteen fifteen, and here's what it says: Even though he slays me. I still will trust in him. Those are out of the mouth of Job. Even though he slays me, I still will trust in him. Regardless of what happens or doesn't happen. Regardless of how God treats me or doesn't treat me. My prayer. It's my prayer. Now let me say that because I certainly can falter and fail. But my prayer, my goal is Job 13, 15. Even if he kills me. I'm still going to trust him. That's what obedience is. Not just, God, when you keep blessing me, boy, I'm going to serve you and I'm going to, you know, you give me that million dollars and I'm going to tithe and all that kind of stuff. No. When things are going great, it's what you do when you're under the test of God that reveals who you really trust. Well, Abraham was tested. Job was tested. According to 1 Peter 4, 12, we too will be tested. Listen, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. Don't be surprised by COVID-19 or political division or anything. Don't be surprised. And then he goes on to say, as though something strange were happening to you. As though God somehow had singled you out as though you were dumbfounded. Well, I thought the Christian life was all about victory. I thought the Christian life was all about the abundant life. Why in the world?
wrongs has happened to me? Peter says, don't think it's strange. Don't let it catch you by surprise. It's natural because God tests everyone. He tests everyone. Why does he test us? I told you that I would share with you why he tests us. We've talked about this before. Number one, to prove the genuineness of our faith, to demonstrate the genuineness of our faith. 1 Peter 1, 7, these have come, the tests, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith You never know how real your faith is until it is put to the test. I know people who fail the test. I've been a pastor for 45 years. I know people who failed the test. They went through a test, or maybe someone that they love went through a test, and they did do what I mentioned a while ago. They were mad at God, and the way they expressed their anger at God was to leave. Leave. I know people who've done that. You probably do too. You probably do too. Was their faith real? Or was it a fair weather faith? God, I'll believe in you. I'll follow you just as long as everything's good. As long as you just keep power on the blessings. As long as you just keep answering my prayers. But now wait a minute. When things get tough, that's not fair. It's not what I signed up for. Think I'll quit. Think I'll quit. Passing the test demonstrates whether your faith is real or not. That gives reason for the test, purpose for the test. Secondly, God tests us to grow our faith. I mentioned a moment ago that faith is a little like a muscle. Listen to 1 Peter 5.10. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. What is he promising? If you pass the test and you go through the uh, test, I promise you your faith is going to be stronger for it. Now, you may not enjoy it. You may have soon not signed up for it. But the result is your faith will be stronger because it is a faith that passed the test. Faith that passed. But how shall we respond? I think Abraham is a pretty good example. I'm not just thinking of Genesis 22 when he was asked to offer his son. I'm thinking at the very beginning of Abraham's walk with God when God said, Okay, Abraham, here's your first test. I want you to pack up. I want you to say bye to mom and dad. I want you to leave everything behind. I want you to strike out. Take, take, take the west highway. Just go west. Well, God, where am I going? I'm not going to tell you. Well, I don't know when to get there. I'll I'll let you know when you get there. Right now, just take highway west and take off. Abraham could have said, well, I'm not going until you tell me where I'm going so I can see what I'm getting myself into. That's one of the conditions that we place on our following God. It's almost like God, I don't like what's behind door number one. Can you show me what's behind door number two? I might like that a whole lot better. And there is a third door over there. I I might want to see what's behind that one too. There was only one door for Abraham, and it was the door of obedience. You either obey or you don't. Abraham obeyed, and he struck out. And he didn't know where he was going until God said, Whoa! This is it. That goes against human nature, though, doesn't it? We like to be in control. We're control freaks. We like to know where we're going and what's going to happen on the way and what's going to happen when we get there. And, you know, we like to plan all of that stuff out. Serendipity is not a word that we're familiar with. Neither are we familiar with obedience. But Abraham was. Anyway, do you think he understood? No. Why did he go? He trusted God. He trusted God. That's the only reason to go. To trust God. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. 
God is testing us. No doubt about that. How are we doing? How are we doing? He's testing us with difficulty. He's testing us with demands. How are we doing? I think you and I will never be successful in passing these tests after test after test until we do what Jesus told us to do. Remember what Jesus said were the requirements for following him? Take up your cross and follow me. Well, wait a minute. There was something in front of that. You remember? It's a thing we don't like to do. It's a thing some of us refuse to do. Jesus said, deny yourself. Then take up your cross and follow me. What? Deny myself? I don't like to do that. Deny myself. I, I like to be comfortable. I like to be secure. I like to be in control. I like to know where I'm going. Deny myself. You'll never be able to know what God can do with you, and I'm talking to myself too, until we follow Jesus' prescription. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And by the way, our crosses are different. Now, in essence, in context, he was talking about being willing to die because that's what the cross represented in the first century. But today, cross represents different things. We all have a different cross. And then follow me. Follow Jesus. Not follow what I think is the right direction to go. Do the right thing according to what I feel comfortable in doing. But to be what Dwight L. Moody said God is looking for one person totally consecrated who will follow God no matter what. I wish I could tell you I want to be that person. I'm not there yet. How about you? How about you? Let's pray. Father, these are hard things. We'd rather talk about the love of God. We'd rather talk about heaven in the by and by. We'd rather talk about your blessings. That's not what we're experiencing here today. We're in the middle of one test after another. And if one test is not enough, we've got several. Lord, help us to be able to deny ourselves. That's the first step. And that's so hard. So hard because we think we know what's right. Because we like things our, our way. We like to be in control. We like to make our own decisions. God, please help us to be willing to say that I will deny myself. And take up that cross, whatever it is, whatever it is. Might not even have been revealed to us yet. But whatever it is, take up that cross and to follow you. And to follow you. It's not an easy road. Boy, it's not an easy road. Not many millionaires in the Bible. Not many comfortable people in the Bible. It's not an easy road. But it's a worthwhile road. It's the road that leads to life. Help us to follow in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me standing? I don't know what it is you need to decide here. Maybe where you're going to eat lunch. Maybe that's what we need to decide. Maybe there's something a little heavier you need to take care of. Maybe God has spoken to you in one way or the other through this old guy up here at the front. If uh, you need to get along with the Lord, you can do so right up here. Prayer. Any of you do that? Can I pray where I'm at? Yeah, you can. But, you know, it just kind of shows God that you mean business when you don't mind coming forward and doing so. Maybe there's some other decision you need to make. You're looking for a church home. I know we rarely have visitors during COVID. We appreciate those who are with us. But if God is leading someone to make a decision here today, we would love for you to do so. Whatever it is you need to do. I'll put a mask on. If you come forward, I'll meet you right down here. 
be glad to pray with you and talk with you, but you've got to make the first move. Okay, Tim's going to leave. Tim? My faith has found a resting place, not in device or Anybody? Uh, anybody? I Maybe it has nothing to do with what we've talked about. Maybe you came here today knowing that God was dealing with you. For me There's something he wanted you to do. I need no it probably not as an easy argument. something. road's not always easy, seldom easy, but I hope it's worthwhile. I hope it's worthwhile, but we'll never know unless we try it. Anybody? Just under the moment, we're going to close. Thank you. Please be seated. Let me just say to those of you who joined us online, thank you so very, very much. You know, when COVID's over, we're not, we're not going to stop broadcasting. We will continue to do that. Uh, it's beneficial. And I know that some people can't come and some people are guarding their health and, and that's okay. That's totally understandable. Uh, but thank you for joining us. Uh, you can find a lot of info on our website, fbcnoble.org. Announcements, prayer requests. You can leave a prayer request. We do have people uh, leave prayer requests. And, uh, you know, if, if we have some contact information, I contact them and, and assure them that we're praying for them and so forth. So a lot of information there. Information on how to give online. Many of you are doing that. And thank you so very, very much. Uh, you know, I mentioned that um, uh, we didn't... We didn't make budget last year, but that doesn't mean that you people aren't doing a wonderful job. You really, really, really are. And we can't uh, carry on without you. I, I want you to know that. Okay, let me share some prayer requests. Uh, if you're here with us, you, you uh, see them there in your uh, bulletin. Um, we have uh, the, the little ones that we continue to pray for, Raylan Williams. This is uh, Dean and uh, uh, Bob Williams' great-grandson, uh, Premi. Uh, has some challenges. Pray for him. Colton, our Downs baby, they moved away, but we still uh, lift them up in prayer. Dawson, uh, dealing with controlling seizures. And then Jocelyn uh, goes back in March uh, to Little Rock. She had a heart, full heart transplant in 2009. Uh, since then, she's always gotten glowing reports, and we pray that she does. What did I do? I must have. When I do that, it I didn't know I had that much power, to tell you the truth. <laughs> okay, I'm back. What? Margie Richardson, she's had COVID. She's been home for a long time. She's been oxygen dependent. Mitch, who uh, works in our sound booth, uh, says she's had a very good week. Very good week. Normally just uses the oxygen at night, uh, just, you know, to be sure and so forth. Uh, but uh, she's doing much, much better. And praise the Lord for that. Long, as long as we're talking to the Richardsons, uh, Mitch's uh, sister and Ray and Sherry's uh, daughter, uh, Kelly, Kelly Keys, uh, needs our prayer. There's, uh, there's some, some issues there uh, going on, and uh, testing is not complete yet, but we, we don't want to forget her. And then Mary Ritchie. Mary is um, one of our uh, blessed ladies who uh, does not feel comfortable in coming, and we understand that. She has a brother that was 100 years old. I don't imagine any of us here are going to see that. And, and he, he went to be with the Lord last night, okay? He's from Houston. They will hold a service there in Houston, and they will bring him here to have a memorial service in the cemetery, and I've been asked to do that memorial service. Don't know when it will be or anything, but pray for Mary. Pray for her. I don't care if she had a brother for 100 years. You know, she's still grieving over the loss of this brother. So we rejoice in the length of his life and the fact that he knew the Lord. But uh, his name was Chester, Chester. So remember uh, his family, if you would. Mary Allen had uh, some outpatient surgery last Friday. Uh, it was successful. 
She'll probably follow that up with some um, radiation at some point. She goes back to the doctor in February to find out when and how and how often and so forth. But uh, remember her, if you would, and then obviously our country. Let's not forget to pray for our country. Paul Smith, would you come and lead us in our closing prayer? Paul's one of our deacons and Sunday school teacher, and he's going to lead us as we close. Would you join us standing, please? Thank you. Before I pray, uh, <clears throat> preacher's talking about our, you know, this pandemic, all the things that's going on. Has uh, really been testing, and he's preached on testing. Uh, we've got people trying to keep the wheels on our church going, <laughs> and uh, I certainly want to uh, express my thanks to my pastor in this difficult time of trying to lead a church. Normally, he would be making hospital visits, all these things, uh, which we, we can't do. Uh, but certainly we can do other things, and we're seeking that. Uh, we're thankful for our praise team. I noticed one of them's not up here. Is, is he Bob or Piano? Is he doing all right? Or, I think he's doing that, good. He said he'd be back at work tomorrow, but he was not feeling real great and thought he would take one more, one more moment off, one more day off. Frances is doing well. She was positive. But she hasn't really had any symptoms. Logan seems fine, and Gordon, Logan's dad, is doing better. Okay. We've got a sound booth that's uh, faithful. We're thankful you saw some of them in action today. Uh, we've got security people. There's all sorts of people uh, trying to keep our church functioning. We're thankful for our staff. There's, uh, Kim and Lori are trying to. Uh, keep our children and uh, teenagers uh, uh, doing what they can to try to keep keep our church and our and what we're about, our purpose, trying to spread the gospel and uh, make disciples. <clears throat> By the way, one of our staff members, he doesn't look like he's going to be 75, but Kim's got a birthday on Tuesday. I better pray and get us in. <laughs> Lord, we're, we're thankful, Lord, that we can come here this morning and worship you. Thankful that you're a God that loves us, provides for us. Lord, you know all about our fears and, and our rebellion, maybe even our laziness. Lord, we know that you've given us a chance, Lord, by, through your Son, Jesus, Lord, that we've got a chance to have joy on this earth if we can just keep our faith and persevere. But certainly to look forward to a day where we'll be united and in a perfect place. Lord, I... <clears throat> I pray that uh, we'll be about our purpose and uh, we're thankful for giving us a purpose. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Serve Him with gladness Enter His courts with song To our Creator True praises belong Great is His mercy Wonderful is his name, we gladly serve him, his great love.